Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch um, of this remarkable archive as part of the Clean Break 40th Anniversary Heritage Project. The project will culminate in a, an exhibition at Swiss Cottage Gallery in March, April of next year. Uh, and, and it'll provide access to a, a public sort of digital timetable, which will be accessible through the Clean Break website. So welcome, my name is um, Alison Freiter and I'm the new chair of Clean Break. After eight years of the wonderful Kim Evans, um, I took over as chair just uh, in the summer. Um, but I got to know and love Clean Break during six years of chairing the National Criminal Justice Arts Alliance. I am extremely excited uh, by the program today because it's a chance to meet the founders of Clean Break and because they take us on a journey through the turbulent landscape, the political landscape of the late 70s uh, and 80s that resonates strongly with my own um, personal and political awakening through feminism and through the fantastically energizing and transforming nature of, of fringe theater um, during, during that period. Jackie Holbrook and Jenny Hicks made a huge contribution to this period of massive social change by producing high quality theater, highlighting the experience of women caught up in the criminal justice system. The slideshow you just saw was a preview of material uh, from the Clean Break archive focusing on the founding years from 1979 to 1889, that founding, founding decade, to that fantastic soundtrack uh, of songs uh, produced in our studios at Clean Break um, in collaboration with uh, award-winning playwright uh, Lloyd, um, Morgan Lloyd Malcolm, who's just won an, um, an Olivia actually for Amelia, and musical director Susie Davis uh, for Fun Palaces uh, made in 2014. The songs are based uh, on the history uh, and uses of the Clean Break building and are called All the Women and Piano Factory Workers Song. Jenny and Jackie founded Clean Break in 1979 and today the company continues to support women in the criminal justice system, putting women's voices at its heart and changing lives and minds on stage in prison and in the community, challenging injustice using groundbreaking theater. The archive we're launching today is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund with the aim of producing a public archive of Clean Break's work at the Bishopsgate Institute in London. The archive contains play scripts, rehearsal and production photography, original artwork uh, from 40 years of groundbreaking production uh, handwritten notes from the founders, uh, original play scripts, uh, original TV uh, and documentary film featuring and or produced by Clean Break, and um, 42 40th year anniversary video interviews uh, with women from across um, the 40 year history. So during the, the session, during the event this evening, uh, we'll be joined uh, by a series of guests uh, to discuss the origins of Clean Break with Jenny and Jackie. Um, we're going to be looking at how we're using that archive uh, to uh, inspire and create new work with Paula Varjak and uh, with a performance from Anne Whiteley. Um, we'll be asking uh, Dr. Sarah Bartley uh, how uh, the archive will be used for research and discussing with um, uh, artistic director, joint artistic director Anna Herman, um, how the archive is, is sort of reinvigorating um, our connection with our roots and core values and taking us forward into a vision for the future. Um, there'll be a panel discussion which we're looking, uh, we're looking at the theme of, of survival. It always feels as though survival is at, at the top of everybody's minds in thinking about um, taking forward and developing, driving the, the creative work. Um, and particularly at the moment in the time of COVID. So actually looking at, um, you know, how we can use the archive to uh, inspire uh, all of the new opportunities that have actually arisen ironically over the last uh, six to eight months, but, but also thinking about really embracing that rich texture of work and, and moving into a future vision. 
Um, so as we go through this, please uh, register in, check in with us through the chat, uh, let us know who you are, where you're from uh, on the chat. Uh, we'll be collecting questions uh, for a panel discussion at the end and, and drawing in um, as many as, uh, as we can, uh, questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A function for your questions and please indicate in the, in the Q&A function if you'd like to ask the question yourself and then we can ask our tech team to enable your audio. So if you could sort of just indicate to me that you're, you'd like to do that. Um, and we'll be recording this session uh, so that actually a recording of it will be available on, uh, on the Clean Break YouTube account afterwards. So, um, I'd like to kick off by uh, introducing uh, Jackie uh, Holborough and Jenny Hicks, co-founders of Clean Break. They set up the company um, on release from prison to, uh, in a, to, to tour plays both to women in prison and in the community. Um, Jackie uh, was uh, a lead writer and performer for the company in the early years writing a question of habit, actually what, still while in Ascombe Grange, uh, HMP Ascombe Grange, which won a Kersler Award. Um, Killers later recorded for um, T TV, for Channel 4 and Radio. Uh, Decade, which toured in Amsterdam. The Sin Eaters, which toured in the USA. And The Garden Girls, which won uh, two Time Out Awards, including Best Play. She left the company in 1987 to take up a post as writer in residence at the Bush Theatre. Jenny also led the company in devising, writing and performing plays, including Under Eros, In and Out, with Eva Motley, Avenues, which, which toured Amsterdam, The Good Life and The Sin Eaters with, with Jackie. Jenny went on to a place at the um, Community Theatre Arts course at Rose Bruford, uh, where she met and collaborated with um, uh, directors uh, Anne Mitchell and Paulette Randall. Jenny actually took a lead in advocacy and campaigning work, which has continued uh, within Clean Break, and she was instrumental in securing charitable status for Clean Break and uh, the funding for the first building, which was in Mornington Crescent. Clean Break's continued uh, to make Camden its home. Um, Jenny left the company in 1989. So I'm just going to kick off now um, by asking uh, Jackie how you and Jenny met and just really taking us back to those early days. Now, HMP Durham, where you met, was, a, um, was closed as a, a place of torture, according to many high level government reports. Um, and prison riots uh, close to men, and yet it was reopened in 1974 uh, for women. And despite the fact there were very few category A uh, women ever uh, sent to Durham, um, there were highly restrictive security provisions, including restrictions on contact, restrictions on visits, um, frequent strip searches, how was it, Jackie, that, that you and Jenny met uh, in Durham and, and, and what inspired you to start writing or thinking about making plays together? Well, um, I went to Durham in, in May uh, 1977. Jenny was already there. She'd been transferred from Holloway. I'd only been in prison three days, I think, when they sent me to Durham. It was, um, there were just about 32 women there. So it was difficult not to meet. <laughs> Um, we had an exercise yard, which was surrounded by hundreds of men who looked over the exercise yard. And it was a very bleak place. And we used to have our hour a day and Jenny and I would walk around. And she said, oh, you were an actress, weren't you? And I said, yeah. She said, well, how about some theater here? And I said, yeah, what the Trojan women. Um, so we laughed and uh, because it, you know, there's no, grass or flowers or anything to be seen. It was just fences and barbed wire and light shining down and guards. But the idea started to kind of germinate. And during exercise, we talked to some of the other women and said, wouldn't it be fun? Let's do some, some theater in the yard. And one of the women had Jesus Christ Superstar. 
um, LP. So we thought, okay, we went to the Trojan Women. We'll uh, we'll do we'll try to uh, just some songs from it really. So we started uh, having fun, having fun in the exercise yard, ho nannying and hey nannying. And uh, then the wing governor called me in. I think she probably thought I Jenny and I were behind this. Well, she knew we were. And uh, she said it would, would have to stop because it was a security risk. This was a maximum security jail. We, we were short term prisoners, but we'd been put there to make up the numbers. Because as you said, Alison, there were just a handful of category A and quite a number of lifers, but we had just been sent there really to make up numbers. So shortly after that, um, I was transferred to Ascombe Grange, which is a manor house in Yorkshire, which has um, a big, room with a stage, they call it the ballroom. Um, I, I auditioned for the annual panto, which they do every year at Ascombe Grange, and uh, got the role of Goody in Goody Two Shoes. That's me, that's the vicar in drag. <laughs> so that's you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we had a villain in it and um, she suddenly got parole and we're only a couple of weeks from production. Uh, we just put it on for about a week for the villagers and you know the women in the prison. And then Jenny Hicks arrived from Durham, just in time to take up the role of the villain and save the candle. <laughs> Quite fast, funny. of course. So what was the difference then? I mean, I, I've been um, I've been in Askham Grange, and and you know I love that that sort of fantastically wooden clad ballroom. It is amazing. But what was the difference there? I mean, clearly there was this tradition of a pantomime, but you did also manage to set up a, a theatre workshop with Jenny. What, with, why, why was, what was the difference there? I mean, guess the security was an issue, but there must have been more to it than that. I mean, yeah, I mean, we'd gone from the, the harshest security to almost no security. We could have just walked out the gates at Ascombe Green. But we had this amazing governor who loved theatre, and Jenny and I and one or two other women had some such fun in the panto. We said, could we have our own workshop which we would run ourselves? Um, just give us a couple of hours once a week. And the governor was all for it, but because it didn't please all of the staff <laughs> to see all the prisoners enjoying themselves in the ballroom <laughs> without any kind of um, supervision, the governor asked a young music teacher who'd helped on the panto called Russ Davis to come in and be our kind of outside influence. So we started our workshop from there. We did um, a production of Agatha Christie's Black Coffee, which the villagers came to see, but we, we couldn't really keep on playing men's roles. So then we thought we'll write our own material. So that's how we began. We, um, about that's five exactly. of us started writing that. that. Yeah, you started writing. Yeah, we, we, we started writing. We had a series of sketches, short plays, um, Jenny wrote a piece set in a drinking club, which she actually had once run her owned herself. Um, <laughs> and I wrote um, about some terrorists in a basement, and several other women <laughs> wrote about various things, talking to plants, dying in a plane crash, whatever. We strung it together as a set it in a kind of newsroom with all the stories strung together, and put it on at the prison. It was, uh, the, the governor invited people in again. One of the people she invited in was from the um, York Art Centre, the artistic director, and he said, I'd love to have you at the Art Centre. Uh, so the governor approached the Home Office and persuaded them. We weren't allowed to say we were prisoners, so we called ourselves Ask Them Out. <laughs> and we had uh, two nights, there were now 22 of us in the group, um, two nights at York Art Centre. We weren't supposed to be known to be prisoners, but I think most of the audience did know. Um, and then we were also invited to the university to perform. And when we got back to the Nick, we thought we'd like to keep doing this. And then Jenny and I started to kind of dream about how we might do this when we got out. Yeah, It's fantastic, isn't it? How it makes such a difference, just the, the governor. I mean, I think we find that now, you know, actually the governor is the person who is so important. Just one individual can make such a difference to, to yeah. You know, to everything, yeah. Fantastic, actually, yeah. Loving. Say, unfortunately, unfortunately, she did die a few years ago, but she was a friend to her, to her dying day. She was. We were close to her 
forevermore, really. Yeah, <laughs> and her family. It was unique in a way. So, so you, um, as you said, you left, um, you left Ascom Grange, and um, and Jenny also left uh, um, Ascom Grange. So then you 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 met again in the Royal Court when yeah. your play, A Question of Habit, won the Kersler. So. Tell us about how that came about and how, what happened. Oh, well, actually, the governor put it in for the Kersler. Oh. It was part of the ephemera script, uh, uh, the ephemera show. And um, I'd been out three months then, and the governor brought some of the women down. It was professional cast reading. Um, and Jenny had just got out <laughs> by chance. And she also came. So when the governor took the women back up to Ascom, Jenny and I went to the pub next door. I think it was the Royal Court Tavern in those days, and started to plan how we could actually get our workshop idea going. We wrote to the governor. She allowed us to keep in touch with all the women who'd been in the workshop. And we thought the thing to do was to have a, something to aim for. It was March. So by August, there would be the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. And we thought, let's try and go there. Let's try and get a venue, get some money together and see how many of the women we can get together to do some of ephemera at Edinburgh. So we had a goal and then we had to find a name. So we came up with Clean Break. That's fantastic. And just on that previous letter that we were just looking at there, it's just an amazing letter from Susan to you guys. And I was I'm really struck by how she mentions the home office in that and some conversation that was going on there that was quite official. And then she says, oh, and by the way, in this letter, you know, that she's going to organize to get this this costume for you made for the nun's habit. It's just extraordinary how she clearly had such, you know, such passion, but such warmth and generosity. And, yeah, and yeah. You know, she was quite a young governor. She was only in her thirties, I think at that time. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. so then you uh, went up to Edinburgh and this was a time I remember well, when we used to go to Edinburgh every year, you know, it was just such a, a fantastically energetic. Yeah, it was fantastic. We had a fabulous yeah. time, yeah. As you can see from the cast list, 11 of us got there and nine from the original Ascombe Grange workshop, which I think is pretty fantastic on almost no money. Roundtrees had given us some money, their, their charity. Um, and we'd done a couple of gigs in London to start us off to got some box office. So, um, so we had this wonderful, well, we were having a buzz, you can imagine. Nine, uh, nine, 11 women together in Edinburgh, oh, sleeping in a caravan, all of us crushed into a caravan at Pennycook. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. And, and we did get a load of attention, lots of attention. And you, so we could see we, you performed at the Pleasance Theatre. Yeah, in those days you could afford to perform at the Pleasance Theatre on almost no money. You wouldn't be able to these days, I don't think, but um, it was a fairly new venue and the London University students were running it and they gave us a very good deal and they were great to work with. You can see their fun program. Um, yeah, it was great. And then you, you continue, are these are postcards written to Susan. I mean, just talking about that relationship that you built with her and these, the postcards are amazing. And she's, she's I mean, you're telling her, aren't you, about how, how successful it's been. Tell us about the reviews and, and you know, you mentioned in the, in there that the Scotsman loved it. Yeah, we did get, we, we got some really good reviews, which was a great help, of course, for future um, promoting the company, um, if we were going to carry on. We didn't know at that point that this would just be it. We just had a buzz. This might just be it. Um, but yes, we were lucky to get uh, very well received in Edinburgh, and we were invited to perform in Berlin, a special unit. The governor of the special unit was a friend of Sue McCormick, our governor. So we were able to go into the special unit at Barlini and put on a performance there for the guys in there, uh, which was <laughs> pretty mind blowing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then, and you then continued to, um, to tour plays? Well, we almost didn't because we, when, we, when we got back from Edinburgh, People wanted to go off and start their life properly, you know, 11 women, but about four or five of us. And we thought, well, why, we'd like to do something about prison. Nothing in ephemera was about prison. We weren't allowed to write about that. Uh, so we decided to do um, some work based on our experiences and try and get back to Edinburgh the following year. And maybe 
keep the group going. And Sue McCormick was once again, hugely enthusiastic, offered to referee us for getting grants from charities and what have you. Uh, so I wrote Killers um, with music by Cat Cool and Jenny and Ava Motley wrote in or out, set in Holloway. Um, and we were off again. <laughs> So it was that it was that same that sort of inspiration from Durham and from that experience that really I mean certainly went into Killers and it, and and really continued to inform your work and your thinking as you were touring plays and actually um, you toured and then you also sort of toured internationally which was fantastic but it struck me um, that this was a, the beginning of a time when you were also engaging with audience. And, you know, I know Jenny talks about Clean Break breaking the silence and, and actually these plays really beginning to encourage audience to talk about the experience of, of, of women in prison. And we, we, we always, right from the start, insisted on having a discussion, audience discussion after the show. Really, it was more about the discussion than the plays. We were uh, always open to anyone staying behind to talk to us. Sometimes discussions went on twice as long as the play. That's really interesting. And that, that I mean, you know, these are high quality, fantastic drama. I've, I've seen, um, you know, haven't seen them all yet, but I've been so impressed. And, and Jenny, you really started to sort of pick up this, this dialogue with audience and think into thinking about advocacy and campaigning work. I did. I did what would we realized once we'd broken the silence, we started women's voices had started to actually be loud and clear. And we were listening to the amount of work we were going to have to respond to if we were going to actually make any changes in the criminal justice system. And, and I suppose it fell into, say, three different areas. There was obviously a need for campaigning. Clean Break couldn't do it all. What we needed to do was to have good theatre that was the communicator and able to, able to engage people's hearts and minds. Campaigning, then there was the welfare needs of the women, and then there was the other creative needs, the entrepreneurial needs, so that women would be able to stand on their own two feet, and education. And there were three very, very um, important women that we met at that time who took on these roles. And those organizations still exist today that Clean Break works with. One was Chris Tchaikovsky. She was the campaigner. She started Women in Prison campaign and took on that campaigning and advocacy um, wing. Then there was Olga Heaven. She was interested in welfare and the um, children of women in prison and the impact on families. She start to started the Female Prisoners Welfare Group, which has now become Hibiscus. Um, and then there was Lenny. She was interested in creative, um, but more entrepreneurial, so that you could make things and you could sell them. And she started a, 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 a beautiful knitwear um, project uh, which became cast. That was the roots of cast. And some of us, uh, not me, but some have still got her original jumper designs now and, and wear them still 40 years on. Olga's got one, for instance. Um, uh, and cast then looked at the educational needs. Um, and we, and another, another very important woman, Prue Stevenson, um, was uh, instrumental in helping set up, uh, helping Lenny set up cast. And Prue also took on the uh, uh, campaign to close H Wing and um, took forward the uh, Women in H Wing support group. So that was, that was really what I became interested in making sure continued uh, alongside the theatre. In order, and oh yes, and of course there's the book we wrote, Criminal Women, um, with Josie O'Dwyer, who was a um, member of Clean Break, performed in the Easter Egg. Chris wrote the Easter Egg. Diana Christina used to do some uh, wardrobe, I think, with us for a while. Pat Carlin, wonderful Pat Carlin, the academic who never stops fighting for women in prison and social justice for women. Um, 
And that's the bid to close H wing that Prue Stevenson took on. Um, and it, and it, it did eventually close, but it, it well, really did take a long time. Eventually, eventually. I think I think they put some curtains in for a start, hoping to keep us quiet, keep them quiet. Um, so the men in the prison couldn't overlook the cells. Um, <laughs> yes. That's extraordinary. But, and that's fantastic. I mean, it really is such a such a firm building foundation for clean break. And just thinking then about this, the sort of you know, moving this organization, which had spawned these amazing other other groups that have sustained and you know as you say Chris mm -hmm. and Olga taking forward these fantastic organizations and then and then producing the the sort of 10-year anniversary report well that after I came back from um we came back from touring America with uh Sin Eaters or Decade we called it then I think um I realized that I wasn't going to stay forever but if this was going to continue, because Jackie's career was taking off then as well. So she was doing other things. Um, I realized I wasn't going to stay with Clean Break forever. But if I if it was going to, if it was going to survive long term, which I wanted it to, which we all wanted it to, then I would have to look at achieving a base for ourselves, a building that we'd always dreamed of, our own theater space with um drop-in rooms and studios. And we would need proper organization, charitable status, proper employment policies, and for all of that funding. Mm -hmm. So I spent those last three years, two or three years, working hard and focusing on that. And I was I was quite proud to, to leave at this time when we had that 10 year plan. And looking back on the organization now, Jenny, from where, where we are now, I mean, how, how, you know, how do you see it? I think it's fantastic. You talk about survival, but you've done more than survive. It's absolutely thrived in this time of COVID. When I look at your website or I come to any of the, the spirit, the absolute principles and spirit, which is that you have to keep going back to the women whose voices you want heard. That's the authenticity of this organization. And for each changing year, they've been flexible enough to respond to the changing environments, but you've held on to that principle. And we went, we, we came to, to watch a, 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 to, for a meeting last year or the year before I, my years get muddled. And as we left, we heard at about five o'clock in the afternoon, music and dancing and singing. There was about 30 or 40 members of Clean Break, absolutely joyful without any alcohol or drugs or whatever, <laughs> as high as you could possibly be. And I thought, my God, it's here. They, they, it's still here. I mean, well, that, that's it. I mean, you not. It's not just about survival. You struggle to survive, but you you don't stop at survival. You just it's still, dream. You yeah, still dream and say no. We're going to have this. That's fantastic. And Jackie, I'm just going to move on now. But is there anything you just wanted to say? And just looking back at all of those years. No, I think uh, Jenny has just really summed it all up. Yeah, has, yeah. Absolutely. Seeing where it's at now and seeing the energy and the joy of, of the members when they were able to be together last year. And of course now this year they're not, unfortunately, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just been amazing last year with the anniversary year. So yeah. let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at how um, some of the archive is being used at the moment mm -hmm. um, to uh, inspire new work. And I'm just gonna turn to um, Paula Varjak and, uh, uh, and Anne Whiteley to, um, to take us through some of the work that you've been doing. Um, Paula, just let me introduce you, you is a theatre maker and video artist, um, writer and performer. And her work includes performance and film, monologue, installation, um, and particip participatory arts. Um, she makes works that, that 
uh, amplifies seldom heard voices and stories uh, by being provocative, through uh, being thoughtful and entertaining. And I think starting as a solo practitioner, Paula, you're now increasingly um, drawing inspiration in collaboration, which I think is, is some of what we're going to see. Um, you are um, a Barbican Open Lab and London Pleasant, uh, Pleasance Associate Artist, uh, and you've been commissioned um, by Barbican, Battersea Arts Centre's Camden Pe People's Theatre and the Attenborough Centre for the Arts. Um, Paula at the moment is, is running the advanced theatre course uh, with members at Clean Break uh, and is, is making the creative response to archival material with, with members. Paula, do you want to um, tell us a little bit about that work? And perhaps I'd leave, leave you to introduce Anna to, Anne to us. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, so the interesting next thing that occurred to me, actually, in terms of this whole subject of archive and working with archive, is that my route into working with Clean Break actually started from another archival project, which I only just noticed is almost exactly two years ago this month. So Anna, Anna Herman came to see a piece that I had done with uh, Fuel that was based on uh, archival history of incarcerated women in England uh, and Ireland that had been done by Professor Marland. And I made a piece in response to that, an audio piece. And then Anna subsequently asked me if I would be interested in working with Clean Break, which I immediately said I would, I would love to. And so now on this project, I was invited to use the archive as stimulus to work with the advanced drama group and create pieces in response. And immediately, I think I wanted to start with photographic images because I like the idea of the image, the image not having any other kind of weight to it other than just distill. So I felt it would be even it'd be easier for members to then project um, fictional histories and stories around them. But before we dove into the archive itself, uh, we played a lot in the first session just around the idea of what mm -hmm. archive was. And I invited all the members to create their own imaginary archive in the space that they sort of took us on a tour around like a museum of of one, as it were. And then that led to them being invited to create characters based on the presentations that they had done for each other. So for example, uh, if Alison had presented her archive, Jenny would then be inspired by that to speak from that place to tell a story as if as it was her, her own. So we kind of introduced this idea of receiving a story that might be true for one person and then creating a fiction from it. From there, I introduced these two images and I have to say immediately everyone in the group was very drawn, particularly to the image on the left because it had a kind of cabaret feel to it. And I guess because it seemed so uh, performative, we talked a lot about the space that this person might be in, the life that was happening before and after the image. And then we started to look at the second image and try to think about what stories might be connected to this person, what life they might be having. After we'd spent those weeks around, around image and creating monologues around image, I then invited members to create a character in response to someone else's monologue. So we were now extracting a character from an image into another character. And then I decided it was time to start to work with written material. I was really interested in 1979 because it's a year after I was born. And I also just really like the idea of origin stories generally. And as someone who is interested in the history of the company to work with the origin of the history of the company from not seemed really inspiring to me. And because I wanted to add another layer of theatricality to it, I gave all of the members in the room these letters in manila envelopes that they we opened together as an act and read together at the same time. And then I invited them to kind of think about what was happening in the letter, why the letter might have been written, what might be taking place before or after. And then the prompt was to create a character that was based on one of these two people. Now, I have to admit, I feel I feel a little bit nervous, actually, Jackie being in this digital space that we're in, because when I started working on this project, even though I knew that this panel launch would happen, I never really thought about the fact that coming to the end of the process that I would be able to see Jenny and Jackie on screen. But I am actually really, really glad for that, because I think what it enabled for me is really just to treat this material as material. And it's not that I wasn't precious about it, but I guess I didn't want to be loaded with the truth of it too much other than what was in these documents. And I wanted the women to have that freedom too. 
So having looked at these letters and worked around these two characters, the next thing I sort of asked was for them to either choose to be write a character based on Jonathan or Jacqueline, or to create a fictional clean break member who would have been a member at this time of the company. And I asked them questions to think about what they thought might have occurred. And the big dramatic question was, did they go to Edinburgh? Did they not? I think one of the members cheated before the next session and Googled it, but it was meant to be something we were kind of fantasizing about. And then of course, on the following session, I brought the next two letters, which answered the question of whether, whether or not the company went to Edinburgh. But of course, we already had the clue that the company still existed all these, this time later. So we spoke about legacy a lot. Around this point, because all this work is taking place in the building, COVID secure, masks, grids taped on the floor, one-way system, anti-back absolutely everywhere. I wanted to kind of free up the space in some way. And so we did a couple sessions in the courtyard in front of Clean Break. And then I wanted to play with the idea of working site specifically. So I invited everyone to take their characters into the courtyard to imagine where this courtyard might be in their character's history, a reason that they might be there and who they might be speaking to, and to make a speech from that perspective. Now, Anne, I invited to have a go as everyone kind of tried out their different monologues. And the first thing she said when she prefaced her performance was that she hadn't really written something. She was just improvising on details from these different letters. And I was so astonished at what she was able to bring out in this improvisation and she's been working on it since. And so I think the most tangible example of the work we've been doing and how we've been building on the archive material to create work that is fictional and character based is this short performance that Anne is gonna present for you. So thank you. Um, and I'm really proud to introduce Anne and this monologue that has come out of our work together. I was never interested in acting. I thought it was all a bit la di da like you know what I mean? A bit soft-like. See, I was planning to be a catwalk model when I got out of that dump, yeah. But my mate, Diane, that was the last I was padded up with, yeah. She told me, you had to be at least five foot eight to be a catwalk model. Five foot eight? Five foot eight, I said. Give over, that can't be right. Well, she said, it were gospel. Well, that were me buggered, weren't it? And you see that loser that got me banged up in here in the first place? He only went and jibbed off with someone else, didn't he? I ain't seen I've no hair of him since the day we got knit. Well, I couldn't rely on him either, could I? Anyway, my mate Diane, yeah, I think she was trying to get me mind off all my troubles and that. And she told me there were a couple of lassies on the sea wing by the name of Jacqueline and Jenny. And they'd wrote this play and they were going to perform it like to the other prisoners and the people on the out, you know. And why didn't I ever go, you know, try out for it and that? I said, try out for it? Me? Me? I'm not interested, I said. All that acting palaver. Well, she said, the governor's given permission for anyone that gets involved. We were going to get extra time outside our cell. Well, I thought, I'm interested now. I'll give it a go. So I did. And I tell you what, it were right good fun, it were. Turns out I was all right at this acting lark. And obviously Jenny and Jacqueline thought so too. They only went and gave me a blooming part. Yeah, me, a bloody actress. Well, I never. And it's not as uh, it's not as easy as it looks, you know. It's hard work, it is, all that rehearsals and that. But I could see how serious all the other women were taking it. And I decided right there and then 
that I were going to take it serious and all. And I did. Well, I thought, you never know where it could all end up. Thank you. That was fantastic, Anne. Uh, fantastic. I, I, I'm aware that you're a writer and a poet yourself, and um, but I was wondering. I know you've done quite a lot of uh, projects with Clean Break um, and Mary Wise of Windsor and, and so on. How did you find creating and performing this yourself in comparison with some of some of the other theatre work you've done? Um, you know, did, was it a sort of different process that you that you went through? Well, I think the, the way I can describe it, because obviously um, being a member of Clean Break and knowing how long it had been, you know, around, it meant more to me because, you know, it was true. And even though my character was fictional, you know, everything surrounding it was true. And so it was just so inspiring, really inspiring just to, to be a part of the archive. Thank you. And Paula, how, how reflecting on the process, I mean, did you, did you find, and certainly in comparison with other archival work you've done, I mean, you know, how, how was it for you? Was it really sort of something that had endless possibility or, you know, was it? I think, I think the thing that was, was very particular about this as, as opposed to other archival projects I've worked in is I was approaching it as if it was just material, if you know what I mean when I say just material, but but then with the sense of the legacy of the organization. And then I think there was there's also the fact that the members, as current members, have a very strong sense, a very embodied sense, I'd say, of the passion and um, uh, that they have for the organization and the commitment they have to being part of the organization. I think that was one of the things we spoke about in the first the first couple sessions actually like what it meant to be a member of clean break and what the organization meant to them um yeah and i suppose then having this conversation with claire a couple weeks ago when i finally kind of landed away from the creating devising space with the members to going oh wow we're going to be presenting it you know with with the women who started the organization and these people are are real people and now it's all held in the same space there's something tremendously kind of powerful and exciting about that for me to be to be part of and even just seeing all of us on screen just now to be honest it is it is fantastically energizing to have the founders here and to hear those stories and and to really sort of engage with that and it, it, it struck me that, you know, um, Jackie, that you had uh, gone back to, in some ways, the experience in Durham. And, and I, I, I can see how, I mean, I think there's a comment in Killers about, um, you know, you're not going home except in your head or, you know, except in your dreams. I mean, that sense of, um, you know, of, of using some kind of other media to, to think yourself into a different place. So I can see how internally it's, it's important you know, when you're in prison, it's sort of focusing on, on, on actually, you know, a, a different role or role playing, thinking differently. Um, but on, on the out, on the out, I mean, was, did you have that same sense of um, somehow using theatre to, to have a sort of personal coping with, with some of that reflection on, on yeah, I, I think there was a sort of cathartic um, yeah. aspect to it as well. Because we were all together, so we could share experience together, our experiences together. Um, we, we knew what we were talking about, like anyone who's been in any institution, um, whether it's hospital or army or convent or whatever, you know, we had that shared experience, um, which was very useful, I think, for us to, to kind of, uh, well, just to adjust to, to life outside, really. Yeah. I, that was fantastic, Anne, and thank you so much, Paula. I'm, I'm just going to sort of bring in some other uses of the um, of the archive and, and hopefully talk with uh, with Sarah, um, Sarah Bartley and Anna Herman. Um, Sarah, um, as she said at the beginning, an introduction is a, um, a lecturer in um, in theatre uh, in Reading, um, and has been very much involved in. Um, the development of the archive and um, helping us think um, think 
its value through. I was um, going to ask you, Sarah, what, uh, how you thought researchers would use the archive. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Alison. And, and, and thank you also to Anne and Paula for sharing that kind of creative response to the archive, which I've been sitting with in a kind of different way. So it was, it was really lovely to, to, to see that. Um, so as Alison was sort of pointing to, I'm a, I'm a researcher on women theatre justice, which is an AHRC funded research project that is being run in collaboration with Clean Break. And it looks at the company's histories, organizational practices, and impact on the contemporary theater landscape. And so for our team of researchers, this archival material has been incredibly important and exciting um, in mapping the artistic and the organizational practices of Clean Break over the past 40 years. Uh, so my colleagues Deborah Dean and Anne-Marie Green have been poring over minutes and, and documented conversations around governance and giving voice and social justice practices within the organisation that are documented in, in board papers sort of from as early as, as, as the early 80s. Um, and myself and my colleague Kiva Makovinci have been really thrilled to see the range of pedagogical and creative work that's captured in some of the course handbooks. Um, alongside communications between staff at Clean Break and commissioned playwrights that illuminate how performance work has been cultivated and supported and developed at the, at the company. Um, so that's, that's a bit about how we've been engaging with it, but beyond our project, um, this archive's depth and contents mark it as a really unique resource in its documentation of changing art practices in relation to criminal justice the alternative theatre movement, feminist performance practices, the shifts to social inclusion agendas in the 90s, and the present day considerations around representation and advocacy and activism. So it's a, it's a real resource kind of across uh, the research field. Because this archive, I think, uh, tells the story of Clean Break, but it also traces shifts and practices across the landscape of activist and socially committed theater in the UK. Um, and so many performance companies um, who were around in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s are not kind of surviving and thriving today and did not survive that shifting landscape. Um, so some of that work has been lost or it's only documented in kind of partial or fragmentary forms. Um, and a field without evidence of its history loses the accumulated knowledges that are passed on across generations. Um, and this archive actually captures some of those histories of prison theatre practice and it allows knowledge to be accumulated. And that's really vital for, for research and learning about, about this practice. And tell tell so us I, Sarah, what, what we've learned from that. I mean, are we learning about, I mean, certainly the, the history of, um, of, of, we're certainly, you know, the change in social policy in, in, in relation to gender politics yeah. from that sort of late 70s, early 80s. And it, it feels as though that was embodied in quite a lot of the, the plays from Clean Break. Yeah, absolutely. And I think lots of those plays are responding to the, their, their political context and really um, capturing that context in creative and innovative and exciting ways that are then made accessible to audiences um, who might not want to sit down and read a, a long policy document um, about criminal justice or the conditions of um, incarceration. So it offers a real kind of route into, into that work, um, I think. And actually in the creative work that is contained within the archive, so lots of scripts and unpublished scripts within the archive, you know, we can actually trace some of that um, reflection of, of policy or reflection of even kind of contemporary conversations around around criminal justice um, so that it's so that's really isn't it? it's that that sense isn't it that we still got this very strong sort of underbelly of um, a lack of response to women's needs in the criminal justice system and that seems to be you know almost you know um, unchanged there's a real inertia around that and you know some of I'm struck by how contemporary feeling uh, some of the plays that Jackie and Jenny wrote and performed you know which you know is we're talking 40 years, aren't we? You know, it's it's still there, isn't it? That that kind of, you know, that drag on on 
women's emancipation that still somehow the criminal justice you know this in in society we've you know that we've steamed forward in so many areas i mean clearly not as much as we'd like to but the criminal justice system has failed women mm. uh, and and failed to to keep that sort of pace of change and mm. it's still really evident in 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 looking at at the plays yeah and i think that's partly one of the reasons why this is such an important and exciting archive um for researchers, but also for practitioners, for students, you know, people can go to this archive and, and see, yes, maybe there hasn't been, or there definitely hasn't been the sort of significant social change that we might have hoped for or envisaged at the end of the 1970s. But, um, but there's now a sort of a place to see what creative work was happening in response to that context at that time for emerging practitioners, for women with experience of um, the criminal justice system to see the work that was happening, uh, you know, and, and I'm thinking, yes, about the sort of early years of the 70s and 80s, but into the 90s and, and the noughties, that kind of documentation of what are the pathways, what are the routes that we can take through this um, system. And, and that's really important that that knowledge is collected somewhere and captured um, so that we can learn from it and, and continue progressing that work. And how we continue to give women those voices and I was bringing Anna, Anna Herman in. Finally, we'll talk with, uh, with Anna and final, but last but absolutely not least, Anna is Joint Artistic Director of Clean Break and, um, and you've worked with the company for I think something like 18 years, Anna. Um, but vast experience and, and expertise in, in theatre and, and social change and specialising in participatory theatre and um, at actually working in the UK and abroad. And you've been such a strong leader for the company and, and responsible for a lot of award-winning work with women in the criminal justice system. Um, it, you know, for, for you, it, how, how does the archive really inform your thinking about the future vision for the organisation, Anna? Um, thank you, Alison. And, and firstly, before I say anything, just to thank you to Anne for bringing to life what those early days might have been like, and to, Jan to Jackie and Jenny for the inspiration that you continue to provide the organisation. Um, and also, Jenny, particularly for the tenacity and insight that you in those early days recognised uh, that a home was important for the organization and you were so so right and I think that's significant in the, in part of our survival and part of our journey is that uh, those early days of, of finding a home and 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 that has been a, an anchor for the organization for a number of decades I don't think Jenny and Jackie know that they um, actually hold such celebrity status at clean break um, you, you really do throughout our 40th anniversary last year every time you came to the building everyone is humbled to meet you and it's hard to explain how the story of how the company was founded impacts on everyone um, who works for the organization who's a member of the organization everyone who's in part of our community it really has a role to inspire us and move us um, and guide us so you know the past guides that you Jackie and Jenny guide us in the archive enables this amplifies this opportunity to kind of look look back at our past to help us know where we're heading um, the, I mean the company has reinvented itself over the decades it hasn't always it has shifted and changed but we have been rooted in the vision and values of the early years. Um, as, as Jenny articulated, the contributions of women with lived experience to the criminal justice system, it's absolutely um, central. And even though it's, we're not self-organized in the way that you were in the founding days, it is a principle and a priority and sits at the heart of what we're mm -hmm. doing, and what we want to do. So that imperative has helped us Re redefine the organization as we've been doing over the past couple of years and the other thing that's really vital is the values of collaboration and sisterhood that you spoke of as well so those strong partnerships that, that you talked of with women in prison with cast with hibiscus they they exist to this day and actually over this period of covid they've got stronger um, they're led brilliantly by the, the women in prison have a brilliant, brilliant role kind of convening and leading uh, the, a, a, 
collective of organisations, women's organisations working in the criminal justice system to ensure that we've got a strong collaborative and collective voice. Um, our commitment to working in prisons has, has sustained for 40 years, and that is because it's such a strong starting point. You started in prison, we can't forget that, and we can't shift ever, we can't move away from that. We don't want to, but we can't. It's women continue to be ignored and not seen and unheard. And so that is continues to drive us and drive the company forward. And then I think the other thing that, that Jenny and Jackie offer us is is the it's an interest hearing you talk about being in prison, performing at uh, Edinburgh Festival, performing at the Royal Court, um, and then touring the USA. I mean, you within the first few years of just setting yourself up, it just you know you the, you inspire us to be ambitious because that's the that that is the starting point. And now we have this amazing archive with these can our canon of plays, posters, letters, audio documents that witness the struggles and the turmoil and the achievements and the decisions and the hundreds and hundreds of women that have contributed to making the company what it is and that pay testament to the needs and issues faced by women affected by the criminal justice system. Um, so yeah, so the archive just amplifies everything that Jenny and Jackie in that story of those founding years offers us. And I, it was interesting the other night there was a the and the Anne Pika lecture, um, which was led by an, uh, an annual event by the National Criminal Justice Arts Alliance, and it happened on Tuesday night and digitally, like like this event is. Um, and Lem Sisse was the speaker, and he was speaking about. Um, his witness, his words being his witness statement um, to the world. And I've, it really resonated for me. And I feel like this archive is our witness statement um, to the reality of women's lived experience. And its creation is, tells our truth and our, our story. So yeah, it's hugely, hugely significant and really joyful to be launching it tonight. With everyone here, with so many, it's so lovely. It's such a shame we can't connect because mm -hmm. I know that there are people in the audience who've been, you know, there are staff members, there are allies, and there are uh, current members and women who've been through the company, women who've connected with us in so many different ways and supporters. So, you know, I, I reach out to all of you across the, <laughs> across the, the Zoom, uh, the Zoom to just, yeah, to say this this treasure belongs to all of us, it belongs to all of us. And, and it is treasure, it is fantastic, and it would be so wonderful if we could be in the room together. I, I just wanted to pick up on the, you talked about touring, Anna, and we did, we skipped over some of that with, with Jackie and Jenny, and you're absolutely right, Anna, I mean, it was astonishing that you did, you know, I mean, getting to Edinburgh on a shoestring, which is sort of what we all did in those days, you know, pushing the car almost all the way up the road, but you know, going to the States on a shoestring is kind of, you know, complete. But, you know, how did you find that experience, Jackie? I mean, you know, in reaching women with similar experiences in um, in the States? Um, well, I, I, it was arranged actually by a geese theatre who do work in uh, prisons in the States and they'd heard about us and they invited us and, um, and Jenny and Celia, who was um, administrating us then, um, sort of organized the tour. And we weren't allowed to go to Rikers Island. We had been booked to go there, but the men didn't, some men in there didn't think they wanted these, these women coming in. Um, and then we weren't allowed to go to Chicago prison because some incident had happened. But we did do a two week workshop with the women in Mitchellville um, Correctional Facility in Iowa. And those are the women there. It, some of the women, they didn't all want to be on camera. That was a lovely, that was a fabulous experience. And we also played Bayview in New York and we did um, an aftercare center in Oakland and, and uh, sort of hung out with some other theater groups. And we also did Boston Women's uh, Festival. So it was a big high for us. It was all on a shoestring, but I, we did manage to get some funding to, to take us there. So that was a terrific experience. Yeah, and I'm sure fantastically welcome. And Anna, some of those uh, those connections are do continue to be made, don't they? Sort of reaching out across, um, you know, across continents to to share experience and to share practice. 
I mean, absolutely. We haven't got a huge international reach. We, um, but the the networks and the, the you know the um, the networks exist. And a couple of years ago, we ran an event with um, with uh, in a way the pre the, the predecessor is that the right word the, before of uh, the AHRC project that we're now doing um, that Sarah's part of with Kiva Macavinci at Queen Mary University, and we ran an international project looking at women theatre and criminal justice and had um, Australia, somebody's daughter in Australia and practitioners in South Africa and around to, to share kind of practice around this work. So there is definitely work taking place and we're looking at how to connect, reconnect through the um, through the Arts and Humanities Research Council project to, to establish those links a bit stronger. And Paula, the, the, the authenticity of that, that woman's voice actually you know, reaching into uh, developing, uh, you know, participating in, in theatre production and so on is, is, is such a universal experience, isn't it? I mean, it feels as though, you know, that's such a shared experience across the world. In terms of developing from the material. Yeah, we're developing from, the, but, you know, the authenticity of, of women expressing, you know, expressing their experiences. Um, I mean, I think I, I suppose as, as much as I was saying we were building, we were building on material to then go where we wanted with it. Of course, the other thing that we held is the members could imagine, as Anne so brilliantly did, elements that might have been similar between their lives and members in the past, or um, hardships that members and indeed maybe even the founders might have followed in the past. And we have an idea of what it means to take a show somewhere or put on a show. Some people have an idea about. Edinburgh. So there is this kind of fusing, which as I guess a lot of great acting is about, of taking something of yourself that is true, matching with something that is imagine the new character and kind of bringing them together. The, we should probably come back to the theme of survival, which is what this panel is <laughs> charged with discussing <laughs> on the program. But um, is, is theatre uh, a key to survival? Uh, in you know for women uh, in affected by the criminal justice system I mean, is that is that something that that resonates with you Anne? that sense of um you know of resilience or building building a sense of uh, of yourself and identity and survival through theater yeah definitely um just as the evening's gone along the, um, my mind's taken me back to when i first started at clean break and I was in a very vulnerable place and I can't even articulate how much this um, company has done for me with my, my self-esteem. Just, um, just using theatre for me has been, it's therapy. It's definitely been therapy for me. And um, yeah, like I said earlier, it's, it's so inspiring. I don't know if you have any idea how much it can change someone's um, trajectory. Is that the right word? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it really does. And um, and what about survival of the company? I mean, it's been interesting, actually, just the, even just thinking about that international issue, you know, that, that actually, you know, these kinds of meetings do enable us to reach across oceans, don't they? But, I mean, in terms of COVID, Anna, um, how are you feeling about the survival of the company? I mean, it, yes, it's been such a challenging year um, for everyone, hasn't it? Personally, for um, and then for organize, for, you know, our well-being, our health, our loss that we're suffering and experiencing as a as a as a global community, and as a and the theatre industry has really suffered, and um, and. We uh, we are uh, in as part of that have been in a way guided by our members and by the needs that have been um, really present from the women that we work with who have been on the sharp end of the kind of health inequalities and and faced faced with immense challenges um, during the COVID period and that has again really informed what we've done during this period we haven't stopped working we haven't we haven't uh, we've 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 had a we've been galvanized to um we've been really supported by funders we've had emergency funding we've been able to to access that and uh, and and 
enable women to get digital um, connections for iPads and for um, and dongles and things because we had to move everything online. That was our priority that we, we, we had to close the building, but we would put mm -hmm. everything online. And then we had to look at, well, that's all very good. <laughs> but if people don't have access online, if people use libraries to get access, then that's not going to, and libraries are closed, that doesn't work. So we were, we've we been trying to work through that. It hasn't been straightforward. And I know there are members in the audience this evening who are probably still struggling. You know, they're, they're still struggling with getting that really working well because it's it's challenging. But we've absolutely and put our focus on doing that, on meeting the needs of the women, on the, our support team have 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 increased that kind of the work that they've been doing we've brought in our volunteers who have really supported that as well because we've got a brilliant community of artists and volunteers who who believe in what the company is doing and want to contribute and make a difference and and so that's been yeah. great um, and it, it's that it's the comments that jenny was making earlier about that sort of notion of it's not just about about theater it's it's actually supporting Supporting members, supporting women, uh, and 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 sort of really bringing those things together, you know. So sustaining and thinking about people's um, health and well-being, and having having that strong focus in in the company, a place for people to come to, you know. That having that vision right from the outset has really informed that sense of survival and. I, I don't know, Sarah, whether that's become a key part of when you've been thinking about researching this archive, you know, that those those strands really of that that need to sustain the company, but also to support to support the women and to build the creativity. It feels as though there's such a, you know, there's such a sort of unique combination in Clean Break there that was started by Jenny and Jackie and, and has really driven the company today. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a sort of other aspect of the project that Clean Bake have kindly allowed us to observe uh, their Zoom meetings, which sort of we started observing in um, in March and then and sort of stayed with them until the reopening of the building in, in September. Um, and that was incredibly generous and incredibly open and <laughs> incredibly characteristic of Clean Break to say, yeah, like join us in this digital space um, and sort of bearing witness to that um, support and that consideration um, and that member led, you know, um, instinct that is then, when, you know, in the contemporary moment has been really fascinating and to hold that alongside um, the sort of echoes down through the years of the same kinds of conversations, obviously a completely different moment. Um, but you know, in that in that archive, again, it, it, it's characteristically clean break. It's very transparent. It's very open and generous. In that archive, there are moments of crisis and, and moments where there are difficult discussions had, um, and it and it's always navigated through kind of a consideration of of, of the members and a consideration of how to um, create artistic practice that responds to the moment that it sits in, and and sort of having those experiences of yeah the archive alongside the contemporary has been a, a a real privilege and yeah seeing the fantastic and that sort of reference back to tethered with these core values but also actually fun and joy and i mean that dancing that you were talking about jenny you know that sense of that that actually echoing through through the years i'm just going to uh, move to bring in a few of the questions from the audience and um jacqueline um is asking a question about the name. And I, Jacqueline, do you want to ask this question yourself? Oh, yes, I've been unmuted. Yeah, Thank correct. you, everyone. And lovely, uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask where the name came from. It's groundbreaking and it's fitting and it's effervescent. And it, I can't see anything fresher. I've actually seen it copied. I don't know how you got to that process of coming to that name. It'd be really lovely to hear it. I think it just came out of nowhere. We thought of, uh, threw around a few ideas for a name and it just came out of nowhere really. And just seemed right. It was just Jenny and, and me then, but... Um, I think it's just one of those moments when it just comes together and who knows what has already been in the unconscious and they say that before you speak it, it's already formed somewhere, don't they? Um, 
and that was just what it was like. It was already formed somewhere, and we both we both almost spoke it together. I think is my memory. Quite soon, quite soon into our deciding to set up the company. Yeah, yeah, quite quite soon when we needed a name because we were writing letters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um. Let me see. I have got a question here about uh, from Ashley Sullivan about uh, collaboration. Um, Ashley, do you, do you want to ask your own question? I don't know this. Oh, there yeah. we go. Ashley, do fire away. Ask your question. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Uh, we can yes. hear you. Awesome. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, Jackie and Jenny, have you ever collaborated with anybody who works specifically in Theatre One Education, um, either in your original work with Clean Pike or right now? Um, my other question was, like, does Clean Pike have any like franchises or premises um, internationally, or is it just simply based physically in Camden? Um, my third question was, Anna, are all the current Clean Bank members um, women with experience with the criminal justice system, like at the start, or has it sort of evolved over time to invo involve more participants? Sorry for the many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start, Anna? Because I... Um... Shall I start with the third one? Yeah, start with the third one. Yeah. Start with the third one. Thank you, Ashley, for your question. So the, we broadened out. I don't know actually whether it was always, I don't know when it shifted. Um, it would be lovely to hear from Jackie and Jenny if that happened within the first decade. But certainly in my time with the company, which has been kind of 18, 19 years, we've, it's been... Um, I know just as I joined, it was women with experience of the criminal, ju of, of, of the criminal justice system and mental health system. And then we transitioned it. So we broadened the criteria to enable to, to support women who identified at risk of, of entering the criminal justice system because of drug and alcohol or mental health issues. So there's a broader, broader criteria of who can be a member of Clean Break than, than I think the, the founding days. But it, I don't know, Jenny and Jackie, whether that changed whether that was within the first 10 years. Um. I, I think, I think it, it makes absolute sense how it's been broadened. We didn't need to broaden it. Uh, I mean, there, we, there wasn't too much room to broaden it in the, in the early days because um, we were the only organization for women in prison. And so there were hundreds already in those early years and our contacts in prison. But then it makes absolute sense to, to look at women who are in danger of being in the criminal justice system. Certainly we went on, and um, Prue Stevenson went on to fund, uh, to, um, to set up women in special hospitals. They were called, uh, uh, that was Broadmoor, Rampton, Moss Side at the time, Ashworth later. Um, uh, because people didn't even know women were just was just housed amongst most of the men in the hospitals for criminally insane, I think they were called at the time. Um, so that makes absolute sense how that would broaden. And, and women in special hospitals are still going as well, isn't it? Um, so that crossover, so that all women who feel on the periphery of the criminal justice system have access. Um, and actually, actually now with the with the women's centres, the network of women's centres that exist now, which didn't exist at all at that point, when you started the company, now you know there's a real a, an urgent campaign to have women not being sent to prison and actually worked within the community and and mm -hmm. and being part of that needs to um, in, incorporate and involve women in community settings as well. Mm. And also the women in the um, in the in the refugee camps, um, immigration status, or all, all of that now is clean break territory. It has to be absolutely. I I I've got a couple of questions um, about um, caste from Rosa mm -hmm. and uh, Hattie Bernay. Um, 
And I, if you want to ask the questions yourself, um, perhaps we could sort of line people up. But I was just wondering, I just saw that Kate Paradine had joined us. And I wondered, Kate, whether you wanted to comment on how, how the network of women's organizations had come together. And um, that's probably putting you on the line, <laughs> on the spot, really. But if you are with us, it would be, it would be helpful since you're now running Women in Prison. Um, mm -hmm. To just, you know, Kate, uh, that's it's great to see. I mean, I can't see you actually, but it's great to know you're there. Um, talk to us about about this the network of, of women's organisations and how you see the the relationships that Jenny was talking about for advocacy and campaigning alongside, um, you know, women's theatre. Can you hear me, Alison? Yeah, can hear you. Fantastic. Hi, okay. Kate. I don't think you can see me, but it's probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> I'm not fit for Zoom video at the moment, and my dinner's cooking in the background. This has been absolutely fantastic. It's absolutely an honour to see all of this. Um, yeah, thanks for the shout out, Anna. I think the whole thing with women's centres and that being a legacy for the sort of work that the founders of Clean Break and the founders of Women in Prison have started and how things could change if we properly invested in alternatives to prison um, is, is a massive legacy that we hope that will be fulfilled in the next couple of years. But we've got a long way to go, but certainly Clean Break are a key partner of ours and theatre for us. And I think one of our staff is on, was on anyway, someone that was in prison is now working in women in prison. Um, that shows what change can happen. Um, so thank you so much and for this legacy that you're leaving in terms of recording um, what the history of Clean Break was. Thanks, Alison. No, oh, thanks very much, Kate. It's lovely to know that you're there. Um, do we have, uh, we, can we have a question from Hattie? Um, is Hattie there? Shall I ask you a question? Oh, there you are. Go, go, Hattie. Hello, can you Lo hear me? Yeah, lovely to hear you. Um, I'm currently studying Applied Theatre at Central, so this has been incredible for me. Um, but I was just wondering, since starting Clean Break, um, this can go to any of you, has there been a highlight or moment that stood out to you where you really felt like you were creating change within society? Jenny, where are you? I'm here. Um, there you are. I, I, I never know when, whenever any asks for a moment, because I don't think there is a, a moment really. There isn't a moment. It takes a lot of different mo moments all working together and change is always so slow. Real change, you know, there'll be a move forward and then a few steps back, move forward. So for me, there, there isn't any moment. It's just the ongoing, the ongoing change, um, and it, and you could get quite depressed really if you think about what is the real change, because no sooner if you, uh, uh, if we look back at the conditions of Durham H Wing, for instance, I, I'm not sure that women are not kept in in. In not the same but equally equivalent horrendous situation in in the immigration camps for instance you know how far have we come in no sooner you you clear up some place somewhere then there's somewhere else to look so I'm, I'm sorry you've got me on a rather yeah, a, a, no, I, a down I, note <laughs> that's a, um, a really important comment I, I just wanted to Anna, did you want to speak? I, I just wanted to say, just to answer that, I, I really hear what Jenny's saying, um, and it is it can feel kind of overwhelming often, the, the, the length of change that, that um, is required. Um, but we had such a special year last year in terms of just in, in celebrating the 40th, and we launched the 40th at the Old Bailey, at the Grand Hall of the Old, ba Old Bailey. And um, there was something significant for many of us, all of us, I think, who were there, who felt that the company, something about what had been achieved over those 40 years, that we were kind of claiming and taking over spaces that were institutions of uh, uh, that, that were in many ways oppressors of, of women's kind of freedom. And we felt that being there in that moment was really, it felt really significant. And some, so sometimes I, it can feel very heavy. And then mm -hmm. it, there were real moments of, 
of of of, of that uh, that we need to treasure that I feel really worth treasuring as well because they really symbolize it is, yeah it is really uh, important isn't it to think about the positive steps because there have been and and maybe you know we need the archive to actually sort of really you know deliver those um and and to sort of map out some of the blind alleys or the you know mm. so that we can really drive forward i just want to bring in deborah coles who's um yeah. inquest and a, and a fellow trustee of uh, of clean break but can we bring deborah in uh, deborah hi lovely lovely to hear, hear you do ask your question oh this has just been such a fantastic evening and it's so great always to hear from jenny and jackie um and and i loved your i loved your performance um it was a question really about the early days and 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 I think what's been really important about Clean Break is, is that it's been a campaigning organisation alongside the theatre um, it makes and through that theatre and I it was a question really Jenny and Jackie about how important those early relationships with Chris, Prue, Olga and Pat were particularly around the campaign to, to, to close H-Wing um, and about that work in, in, in speaking truth to power, because as somebody who, well, I'm, a, I'm biased about the work of Clean Break because I'm a trustee, but I also work at Inquest. And of course, Inquest, Women in Prison and Wish were all formed around the same time to try and shine a light on those injustices and ill treatment. And I think it was really great, Jenny, that you also flagged up uh, women who are incarcerated in immigration centres as well and how in a way that kind of prison industrial complex has, ha has grown and how important it is that those voices are also heard. So sorry, mm -hmm. a slightly longer question, but, um, uh, but thank you. Thanks very much, Deborah. So really about those relationships in the early days, Jenny. They were absolutely vital. They were vital. They were, they were the most nourishing relationships, and and they that those relationships speak speak to the survival of Clean Break. We couldn't have done that on our own. The theatre company couldn't have done that on our own. And to, to have those women who had that energy, that enthusiasm, that absolute dedication, that that we had at the time. You know, we none of us had any money. We had nowhere to go. Um, all of the things, uh, but but that 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 fed us. It was the relationships that fed us, along with the bag of chips. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Play, the plays were very much campaigning plays later mm -hmm. on. Like uh, Sin Eaters was based on Judy Ward, who was went eighteen years in Durham H Wing before her conviction was quashed, and well, Annie McGuire and yeah, uh, Carol Wilson all had their uh, convictions quashed. Mm -hmm. Years and years they were in Durham with nowhere else to go, a tiny unit, nowhere else to send them. And our plays were really flagging that up and that fueled us and that gave us, you know, that, that kind of energy to try and, well, to get involved with, with these other groups and other people and try and do something mm -hmm. about it. And we had a lot of help from people like Sarah Trevelyan and mm -hmm. um, lots of people who, who um, Laurie, Taylor, people like that. He'd been a, a teacher in Durham when it was men and people just kind of willing to help us to try and get that unit closed. And eventually it was, but I don't think it, I don't think it was anything to do with us really. It went on for a long time uh, after, but we, we did our best anyway. You know what? The um, yeah. Sorry, the thing sorry, that changed yeah, yeah. though, the thing that changed was it was open up the women weren't yeah. alone in Durham from yeah, the moment yeah, yeah. we 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 came out yeah, and voiced right. things yeah. and women in prison privileges yeah. Yeah. yeah women in prison had us and a lifeline and we continue to go back in as you still do today sorry uh, and that that's fantastic unfortunately I think I am going to have to bring this to a, a close but mm -hmm. and, and it's a, an amazing place to end actually Jackie with that extraordinarily modest comment from you about it wasn't anything to do with us it <laughs> absolutely was a lot to do with you I mean I think you know you created a whole social movement here you know as you say the the plays were fine wonderful theatre great tension of drama in them and, and but they tell they tell the story and I think at some point in some of the archive, I can't remember where I read it, but you said, you know, we weren't 
you know, we're not hectoring, we weren't trying to, you know, to, to sort of, it wasn't propaganda, but we were expressing an experience. We were telling the truth. We were speaking truth to power, as, as De Deborah commented. You, you really were doing that in such a way that was incredibly powerful. And you did create a, a you know, a, a great groundswell and, a, you know, huge energy to create these, or, you know, organizations, you know, along with Chris Tchaikovsky and Olga and so on. Uh, and they've, you know, that kind of collaboration is, you know, the energy and the magic of that has really, mm -hmm. um, you know, has really driven the values of Clean Break. And it's been such a fantastic discussion. And, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing, um, Jenny and Jackie, and for a wonderful performance, Anne. You're yeah. really resonating with, you know, all of that sort of wonderful early experience. And thank you to Paula and to Sarah um, and to Anna, of course. Um, and uh, so I just want to close really with um, uh, just a few final comments, really mostly thanks. Thanks to everybody um, for attending this, this um, wonderful evening. Um, and we are hoping, as I said, that there will be an exhibition. Uh, and of course, the, the archive will be publicly available at the Bishopsgate Institute, but that there will be an exhibition in Swiss Cottage in, in March, April, 2021. Uh, or at some point, um, if it isn't then. So um, that would be fantastic. Um, the, uh, the archival material, you, you can, um, once lockdown has lifted, uh, you know, the, and social distancing mechanisms are in place, you can access, access the archive at, at Bishopsgate Institute. Um, I do really want to thank the National Lottery Heritage Fund for providing the support for, uh, for building this archive. Um, so thanks to them. Um, thanks to, to Anna for the huge amount of work she's put into this. Um, I particularly want to thank Claire Stone, who's the Heritage Project um, Lead at Clean Break, who's just done some fantastic work in putting this all together. Not only putting the archival material together and curating the project, but actually curating this evening, uh, Claire. You know, this is carefully choreographed by Claire and really fantastic. And thanks also to, to Rachel Prosser at the Bishopsgate Institute, who's been so helpful and supportive in, in developing the work. Um, and so, and so, thank you to all our guests, and particularly thank you so much to to uh, to Jackie and to Jenny. Thank you for starting, for co-founding this beautiful company. Uh, and thank you for being with us. This, this has really been the most exciting and extraordinary evening. And I just can't encourage people enough to watch those plays. They're fantastically contemporary. You know, look at the archive, read the work uh, and, and support us. So thank you all very much indeed. And have a to you, Alison. Of evening. Thank you for sharing it beautifully. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great supper, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All the women who've stood up before us, I'm from their fury, I'm from their fight. I feel their blood flowing fast through my veins, I feel their sweat as mine. I feel the tears rising up in my own